Good evening and welcome to tonight's Sheep Connect um, webinar on summer forage crops. I'm Jodie Rizzeo O'Brien, um, and I'm one of the project coordinators for Sheep Connect. So just for you, for those that are not familiar with Sheep Connect, um, just what is Sheep Connect? It's an extension project which provides opportunities for producers to be involved in programs where, where they can make positive change on their property. And we have Sheep Connect in both the pastoral zone and the agricultural areas of South Australia. If you don't already follow us on Twitter, please do so at Sheep Connect SA. We also have a fantastic website, um, and I've just done a screenshot of it here, um, that has lots of wonderful resources on it. Um, and the webinar from this evening will be uploaded to the um, box at the top. And there's a whole range of webinars there that you can have a look at at your leisure that we've held over the last 12, 18 months. So a project such as Sheep Connect is not possible without the funding of Australian Wool Innovation, Primary Industries and Regions South Australia and the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund. And we thank them for their ongoing support of Sheep Connect. Just um, a disclosure statement from the Government of South Australia. Tonight's webinar, first we have our first speaker, which is Craig, and he's going to be talking about summer forage crop agronomy. And then we'll have um, two speakers, Ben and Bruce, talking about their producer experiences. So I'll hand over to Craig to talk about summer forage crop agronomy. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Jody. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Altman. So a week ago, I was enjoying a long weekend, uh, not thinking about summer fodder. Uh, being a Victorian now, I get to get the luxury of the Melbourne Cup uh, when I was contacted to see if I'd be happy to present some information regarding summer forage crops and I immediately thought uh, where will summer forage crops have a fit from now on this year uh, so rather than doing a general presentation on summer fodder I've titled, titled my presentation to sow or not to sow having the intention to concentrate on any opportunistic sowing window that presents itself from now on Due to this, uh, irrigators particularly may not find this presentation or may find this presentation less relevant, but uh, nonetheless, there'll probably be information that they'll find handy, hopefully. The title there, to sow or not to sow, are you thinking opportunity summer fodder crops? Here's a few things to consider. So for those, for the benefit of those who don't know me, uh, over the course of the last 20 years or so, I've been involved in, to varying degrees with uh, aspects around the management of summer forage crops, mainly in the high rainfall and irrigation areas of South East South Australia. And over that time, uh, my main exposure has been to brassicas, I think it's fair to say. But and having said that, I've also had input into uh, uh, sorghum, millet, uh, rye grass, cereals, clover, lucerne, fodder beet in more recent years. And so uh, I hope you can appreciate uh, that to put 20 years into 20 minutes and make it applicable to uh, the many varying situations that might arise is uh, easier said than done. My goal this evening is to present information for you to add to your toolbox uh, to assist you in decision making, planning and production of summer forage crops. If you've grown summer forage crops before, this may at least serve as a timely reminder. Uh, if you've not got any experience in this field, uh, this should serve, and I hope it serves as a basis to do more research. Um, I'll finish off with some examples of experience over time uh, from sowings from now on, on the back of um, summer rainfalls, if the time allows. So to get to the topic, um, I'll take you through decision-making, agronomy, and some animal health. Uh, I know this is, the animal health part's a little bit off topic, but I feel that you, the, the two go hand in hand um, when it comes to the production and, and you know, the success of the crop. Uh, so working through the process of why, what, when, and how. Importantly, something I'll harp on about is planning, preparing, and doing it right. I see similarities between low rainfall autumn cropping and summer forage cropping. Uh, often I've said, you know, summer cropping's like mallee cropping. Um, they both share same, some similarities in that stored moisture, in-crop rainfall, paddock by paddock decisions, cost of production, timeliness, variety choice, risk, etc., are all very important considerations. Uh, small variations can have large impacts, as seen in many autumn, winter, sown crops this year. 
I'll take the opportunity to briefly mention it has been demonstrated in short season areas that summer forage crops can be sown earlier than traditionally done in long season environments and uh, used as season extenders at least, even if you don't get a full summer grazing out of them. So just something on the side. So the current situation, I just grabbed these screenshots uh, off the bomb website a couple of days ago. Um, days are getting longer and hotter, increasing evapotranspiration, and a lot of the state has limited stored moisture. If the seasons pan out as usual, subject to rain, the earliest we're likely to see our next period of uh, kinder, if that's the right word to use, dry land growing conditions will be March or April uh, next year. And so depending on where you are in the state, cool season annuals and perennials are losing quality or having finished growing, stubbles uh, being becoming available as harvest uh, is completed. Um, some paddocks are drifting already. Uh, so, Summer forage crops uh, do present the opportunity to grow feed and cover. Um, obviously, the better the conditions, for example, fertility, stored moisture, and in crop rainfall, the better the crop. I mention this because I've seen results of not having trigger points that allow you to capture opportunities. And as a result, money is spent resulting uh, from my observations from a bit of desperation, which is understandable. In terms of how much feed these crops can grow, uh, in, uh, in just the few examples you can see on the screen, uh, there is a variation in water use efficiency ranging from six kilos of dry matter per millimeter to 57 kilos of dry matter per millimeter. And at a quick glance, uh, 25 kilos looks around the mark. Uh, I'm not sure that if you look closely, there's a theoretical figure uh, used by APSIM of 90 kilos per millimeter. Um, not sure if that's still current, but I guess what it does demonstrate is the potential if things go right. Your time of sowing, soil fertility, constraint, soil constraints, uh, moisture, species, variety, pest and disease, pressure and evapotranspiration will all have an impact on this result. Uh, from now on, the, for most of the state, the optimum time of sowing has passed. Uh, soil nutrient mineralisation will be determined somewhat by rainfall. Uh, I'll touch on the species and variety choice later in the presentation. We've just had a wave of aphids go through and I saw the first lot of moths uh, last week. And uh, needless to say, evapotranspiration is only going to keep on the increase. So that sort of uh, paints a picture of where we're at. Um, actually, well, I'll just go back to that presentation. So that there's at a crop zone last year, um, uh, at uh, near Horsham, uh, Victoria, and yeah, that you can see in the background that was uh, that's the summer crop, and that survived right through. So can be done. Um, righto. So continuing on the why theme, uh, summer forage crops can provide quality feed, and the quality and palatability will vary between species and varieties, and growth stage. Uh, I consider brassica to be reliably suitable for animal growth, while sorghum and millet provide varying results depending on the type and class of animal grazing and the grazing system. I guess I, I can't stress enough uh, knowing, the, the, knowing the quality of what's being grazed and the amount of feed on offer, as uh, these crops can be deceiving on both accounts. Um, they're green and they're, they're tall at times, but uh, very different to a dense pasture. Uh, so monitor your stock and you only use the published qualities that you'll see in brochures uh, and alike as a, as a range. Um, averages at the end of the day are exactly that. Um, so one of the considerations of summer forage crops is the cover crop aspect. Uh, those who do sow cover crops mention benefits including uh, weed suppression, erosion control, improved soil health, increased soil organic matter, soil regeneration, uh, eliminating fallow, creating a source of organic nutrients as well as forage. Uh, those in winter waterlogged areas can strategically use cover crops to dry out profiles and improve infiltration, which can have a big impact on the uh, following crop. 
So cover crops aren't for everyone though, and in some environments, as summer fallow results in stored moisture and nitrogen. Uh, I think a point I hadn't considered until I attended a biological conference this weekend is that those cover cropping and those doing it well consider cover crops to be the most important crop and after that everything becomes easy uh, from their experience and so with this in mind uh, cover cropping isn't an opportunistic crop as such for those guys. In this presentation, as I mentioned earlier, I'll concentrate on the scenario and the window of opportunity from this point in the year uh, for dry land operations. Um, if I was presenting on summer forage crops, just as a general presentation, there are plenty of opportunities to sow for extending the spring summer feed and or uh, filling the winter feed gaps. However, I'll concentrate on a handful of options, and these include uh, forage brassicas being tillage radish and, and forage rape, and C4 grasses being uh, sorghum and millet. Sometimes it's not clear what option is best, and it becomes an exercise in, in weighing up the pros and cons. So uh, starting with brassicas, as mentioned earlier, feed quality is often better than sorghum and millet, uh, often or always, uh, but uh, brassica growth in autumn as the temperature drops, so you've sown it now, you've got it through summer, going into autumn, if it survived through, uh, yep, often those growth rates, or always uh, as it gets really cold, are better than sorghum and millet. Sorghum and millet are frost tender, so, and uh, even cool nights will check their growth. Um, brassica residue is often easier to manage to sow through in the autumn than millet and sorghum, uh, so less paddock preparation, just depending on your um, your system. Uh, taking a closer look at tillage radish, it is very quick to first grazing compared to forage rapes like Blue Gorilla and Greenland or, or winter quinolas like Phoenix and Edimax. Uh, another advantage of tillage radish is that it has a large seed size, a larger seed size than uh, rape and canola, enabling deeper sowing depth to chase moisture in the seed bed. Uh, mixing tillage radish and with forage rape is becoming common. Uh, tillage radish providing earlier feed and rape holding its quality longer after the tillage radish has senesced. Uh, I mentioned the benefits these crops can go beyond uh, the immediate feed. Um, tillage radish is known for its contribution to soil health, including overcoming compaction. So uh, moving on to sorghum and millet. Uh, sorghum and millet perform better than most other annual summer crops when soil moisture is limiting, as they normally have high water use efficiency and sorghum usually performs better than millet on this front. Um, sorghum and millet can also be baled uh, if there's enough growing there, of course. Um, the compromise is metabolizable uh, energy and crude protein of millet and sorghum are normally less than forage brassicas. Um, millet and sorghum and tillage radish have the potential role in double cropping following hay and crops. So get up and, and go early, um, yep, warmth and uh, can get them in a bit deeper like we've already discussed. Uh, millet and sorghum compared to brassicas have less disease and pest threats than brassicas in most seasons. Uh, my experience with sorghum and millet is that yields often fall short of potential due to a period of cool temperatures at some stage during the summer. Outside of species choice, it's worth doing research into plant back periods, both for the summer forage crop and the following crop, as well as herbicide tolerance and weed control options required. There's conventional and clear field options available in brassicas, seed treatments that act as safeners in sorghum in certain situations. Uh, it's also important to note that millet and sorghum have different herbicide tolerance. Uh, in terms of seed treatments, where quick grazing is required, ensure the seed treatments grazing with holding period fits your program. Sheep and cattle have different grazing preferences in terms of forage height, so it's worth noting best practice for sorghum is to let it reach at least 600 mil before grazing. From, that, from the height of 600 mil and with adequate moisture, sorghum can grow quickly, and uh, with height, it loses quality quickly as well. Uh, finally, I should note that sorghum and millet are in short supply this year. Uh, now, with um, a multi-species mix, uh, the reasons you might choose to use a multi-species mix include uh, reduced risk of one component failing to establish or, or be productive at least, uh, potential animal health benefits in some situations, 
and the potential soil health benefits with some combinations as opposed to mono species if, uh, if you're sort of doubling your forage as a cover crop. Um, look, the, uh, the pros are balanced uh, by the cons in some systems. Uh, for example, you know, herbicide options uh, may be limited or maturities might not match up quite right when you're grazing, um, all those sorts of things. So, yeah, um, it's, uh, and although not a concern from now on, soil temperatures may be too cold if you're considering early sowing, say so sorghum versus uh, um, uh, rape. So uh, on to the how part of the presentation. I'd suggest doing a feed budget. And it doesn't have to be hard, just back of the envelope. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the feed budget will not only demonstrate the downsides and upsides um, in terms of returns, but I think at this stage, uh, feed budgeting will also help understand the significance of the room and adjustment period going on and off the crop, given that we've got, you know, even if you sowed it today, you've still got a number of weeks before you're grazing it. And in that period, in a number of uh, instances, there's probably already going to be grain feeding going on. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, before the uh, summer crop is ready to graze, and once you've done a feed budget in combination with the other considerations, if it makes sense to sow a summer fodder crop, uh, it's time to consider the paddock preparation. So um, paddock preparation is going to be different for everyone. There's uh, some basics that need to be adhered to and you know, soil seeding depth and seed soil contact. Uh, we'll go a big way to getting everything up. But uh, yeah, so yep, paddock preparation includes seed bed, weed control, insect control, etc. And again, I'll stress the importance of observing plant back periods uh, in my career. More than one person has sown a summer crop only to recall after nothing comes up or the crop is suppressed that it had been sprayed earlier in the year with something that, uh, yeah, they'd forgotten about. So now that you've worked through the pack pre preparation and uh, looking at sowing, uh, the next decision, probably a very difficult one in a lot of cases, but a very important one is whether to sow before or after a rain, as it's commonly the case, early autumn sowing in short season environments, uh, direct drilled with stored moisture in anticipation of rain and you know, followed up by a rain soon after emergence is an excellent scenario and will give more early growth than sowing after the rain at that early stage uh, into dry soil with no rain following. But of course, targeting good timing or ideal timing increases your exposure to the risk of it not raining at all. So yeah, there might've been a lot of money spent up front, but uh, everyone will make this decision differently, I'm sure. While considering when to sow, you can be thinking about fertiliser at the same time. The decision to use fertiliser with a paddock by paddock will be a paddock by paddock decision. Uh, I will add though that summer crops are generally very responsive. And as shown by the image on the slide sown in late September at around six, a photo taken around six weeks. Uh, yeah, it's, um, you see the response there. And talking about fertiliser, subject to growth potential, there may be opportunities to top dress crops and drive production a bit further. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning briefly, coupled with nitrogen though, that uh, nitrogen use does have the potential for nitrate poisoning. So um, just be careful of that. Um, and onto uh, insects, they can cause damage in all summer fodder crops. Uh, probably fair to say brassicas are hit harder more often than sorghum or millet. Uh, and what I'm leading to is carefully consider your insect options and strategies, be they uh, IPM, seed dressings, pre-emergent, uh, in-crop, etc have them mapped out how you might want to tackle them. Um, there are, then there are weeds and along the same lines as pests, consider your individual paddocks and be prepared. Weeds will grow quickly and sometimes herbicides aren't in stock. So please do some preparation and have some contingency plans. So uh, moving on, you've, uh, you've grown the crop and in terms of sorghums, uh, it's reached its height, uh, millet, We'll have to be well anchored. Um, brassicas will have to be anchored and some varieties require ripening or maturity period. So uh, grazing with holdings will have to be observed as well. So it's time to graze. Have 
adequate clean water supply, uh, room and adjustment and crop introduction strategy. So there's going to be, as we discussed, there's going to be some, not only uh, room and adjustment, but also uh, just, it's going to be a completely different crop. So it's not uncommon for animals to wander around for a couple of weeks before they really get a taste for the crop and move into it. Yep, so a palatable fibre source, something to help with that room and adjustment. Uh, and consider uh, your grazing management and its influence on productivity of the crop and the animal and uh, through improved utilisation, regrowth and persistence. In addition, provision of sulphur blocks has provided benefits in grazing sorghum uh, for animal health. So, yes, uh, so then you've got to work out when to hit the button. You've got your, uh, you've got uh, the contract seeder or your own gear all, all ready to go. The seed, you've uh, lined up with your seed supplier uh, in advance because just depending on where you are, that seed might not be held or in the case of sorghum and millet this year, uh, you know, it might not be readily available so there might be a bit of chasing around to do. Um, and then you've got your trigger point set up and, and bang, it's uh, it, time to go. So uh, to finish off, I've heard it often said that uh, seed won't grow in the bag, but uh, done incorrectly, it won't grow out of the bag either. And uh, I'd like to leave you with this message, um, plan, prepare and do it right. Um, so you'll see there that in that area, one seedling came up and uh, that was broadcast and, and not rolled. Uh, there's about eight mil that followed a couple of days after, but yeah, uh, compared to, I haven't shown it in this photo, but compared to what was drilled, um, yeah, it was quite different. So yes, um, I hope I've, I've left you with a good base to ask the right questions and to make better decisions. Uh, all the best for summer. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Um, I've got a couple of questions here and I encourage um, the rest of the audience to send through your questions that you might have. We can always ask Craig those at the end. Um, so Craig, one question is that's come in and you, you sort of addressed it there about grazing. So when and how early can you graze? What sort of you sort of mentioned about anchoring? Any other pointers that you might give to people about when to graze your summer forage? Certainly. So uh, with the, uh, it'll come down to variety by variety and it'll come down to season and there's a few things that come into play you know stress seems to ripen some things a bit quicker um, than others uh, other uh, others uh, well, i'm talking brassicas now uh, some are quite palatable and some will be ready to graze when when they're ready to graze uh, so yeah so to run through what, what i touched on there if you say you know, tillage radish for example there's a general strategy that jump in and graze it before the tuber starts to develop. So that might be four to six weeks um, after you first sown it and then remove the stock and uh, let the tuber develop and then you'll get a, a repeated grazing off of that. Um, rapes, you could be in there as early as six weeks. Uh, you could, it's unlikely in summer, but from a spring sowing uh, going into summer, you know, they could be sitting in the ground as, as long as 12 weeks in some cases um, before they'll be right to graze. Uh, sorghums, um, it's a it's a height thing uh, to, to be on the safe side. Um, you know, it's a bit of a blur between 600, uh, but that's a general suggested height. Um, so, Yes, it's going to be a case by case scenario. It's not a hard and fast rule. It'll be seasonal dependent and variety dependent. Yep. Excellent. Um, one more question here about what would you um, recommend or some suggestions for a multi species mix for summer grazing, realising that you can't give specific advice, but what sort of mixes would people <laughs> maybe consider for grazing if we are talking oh, about mixes? Man, I've just been to the. Um, uh, biological farming uh, conference and yeah uh, I think when you're starting off uh, a good place to start is um, I think starting with the, the more reliable options so if you said start with a, a brassica 
uh, sorghum millet type mix. Um, chuck in, uh, chuck in some peas uh, or, or something along those lines. So it's you start to get into that cover crop scenario, and it's not just about the feed; it's about the um, it's about the soil health as well. So there's a whole lot of things. If it's just for a multi-species mix, and you're looking to do the uh, looking at the animal health aspect, um, yeah, that millet ripe mix or or ripe sorghum mix um winter wheat from an earlier sowing works quite well uh as a fiber source um herbs if you're in uh so plantain or or chicory uh are another couple that get included that i didn't touch on in the presentation um but yeah as i as i mentioned like uh, there's a bit of planning that goes into what you might mix with your with your mix one the, the time of year for example soil temperature but also uh, herbicide so that you might need to use in crop so if you're not planning on using herbicides it makes life a bit easier but um, yeah, it just depends on what your plans are yeah thanks for that Craig I think you've given um, a few options there and I think um, Ben and Bruce will probably expand on that as well and um, Maybe we'll yeah. have a bit more discussion about that if we have time at the end. So, no, thank you so much, Craig, for your presentation tonight. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, which is Ben Ranford from Cleve. Ben's going to talk about his experiences as a producer in sowing summer forage crops. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Jodie. I'm uh, Ben Ranford. I'm a farmer from um, Eastern Air Peninsula. And uh, so, basically, thank you, Cathy. Um, I'm a first timer at this as well. So um, you're in good company, Craig. Uh, so um, Eastern Air Peninsula between Cleve and Arno Bay, about 330 mil rainfall, um, Mallee environment, um, loamy to sandy soils and um, sort of neutral to apples. So, uh, so my experience with growing um, warm season covers uh, which is what I'll sort of focus my talk on, is uh, only spans over um, the last 12 months, really. Uh, I sowed some things uh, starting in spring last year. And uh, so uh, my experience is pretty short and sweet, but um, I'm very excited about um, the potential of these C4 plants and what they can um, uh, bring and the benefits they can bring to our systems. So I'm not a sheep farmer. I've, I, I, I didn't realise that this was a Sheep Connect um, program. So basically, uh, uh, so my my uh, summer um, plants haven't been grazed by any livestock of mine, plenty of wildlife. But um, yeah, so my, mine's been pretty much to cover the soil um, and chose this cover uh, slide because um, this this was uh, a, a failed wheat crop only months before. The the um, last year and this year have been very dry. And uh, so um, in September last year, there was a, a wheat crop that would have only gone about uh, 200 kilos to the hectare. So I chose to terminate it in September. And at the start of October, we planted suns and millet, and this is that um, field in January. And um, it started with no subsoil moisture and, um, and really only 100 rain to do what it's done. So that's pretty exciting. So I'll, um, I'll basically, I'm sort of going to focus a bit on this attic as we go along because I took it right through to harvest. But most of our covers um, uh, we um, terminated in January, so that um, you know before they set seed and that job of covering up. So um, my favourite um, summer forage plant from my experience is uh, the sunflowers. I don't think they they would be as good a um, I think they're a real grazing option, but certainly you know or actually growing um i think they stand out they're very well adapted they they punch through into the harder soils but they don't mind the sand they'll germinate the soils so you'll get them out the ground establishing strongly um way before the sorghum millets and 
some of those real warm sea things will um, want to play. So, and the, and their architecture, you know, they get up above things and um, create shade, and and um, they also have a great deep root system. And I've never seen um, soils crack open. Um, so on 12 inch row spacings with the sunflowers, the, the soil was actually cracking open between the plants. So uh, um, yeah, they're certainly um, uh, doing some work under the ground. So uh, I've, I've run a disc seeder now. So my tillage is all done with plant roots uh, and everything else seems to love them too. There's a variation. Um, so oh, another thing is with the seed, um, yeah, I think if you're, if you're playing around with summer forages um, and things, you want to be buying really expensive hybrids if you don't need to. I know, um, you know, in the high rainfall areas, that's probably different. But, um, you know, if you want something to grow and cover up the ground, quite often, like my sunflower seed and seed, you know, I was uh, sourcing that for about $1 a kilo and it was still really good, um, clean seed. But, um, you know, you can't times that um, if, you, if you are not careful. So, um, yes, yeah, so the other thing, yeah, sunflowers just host so much good uh, biology and this was a 43 degree day and there was um, ants and bees and pretty birds everywhere and uh, yeah, it's just a real, um, yeah, very supportive of all good guys who aren't hanging around. So this is the French white millet. This is the um, sort of the sort of yin and yang of my mix. Um, I, I plant the sunflowers and the millet together. The, the, I think a, a millet like Craig was saying, you know, uh, if you have a mix of things, um, you know, your livestock can choose what they want. Um, they have different maturities and all of that. But also just as far as covering the ground, this this will tiller and cover the ground at ground level. Um, it's got a fibrous root system. You know, it contrasts and complements the sunflowers really well. Um, the, the the millet I found uh, was particularly good on the sandy soils. Um, yeah, offered. Um, yeah, once it once it got established, it, it is a bit fragile. It's a tiny little seedling when it comes up, and, and not much bigger than canola seed. But once it gets going, it's um, yeah, it's very tough. And uh, yeah, um, I found it a really good cover plant. So that's all French white millet in the background there. When it comes to, um, I guess the principle that. Um, You've got to be aware that because you're sowing, you know, at this time of the year, again, like Craig was indicating, those evaporation levels are pretty high um, and your window are going to be pretty short. So, um, you know, I, I, I've been sowing deeper and deeper um, to try and keep weeds in some good moisture uh, because it's been worse than them getting left um, above the low tide mark and half germinating and losing your seed because it dry, the soil dried out. Helping all of that is, of course, if if you can choose a situation or create a situation where you've got cover, plenty of cover, and uh, you know standing straw, or if you can in early winter and bomb it out, and you've created some have a better. Um, environment to seed in bring, I think um, that will pay off and I'll show you later um, the trouble uh, you can get into when you don't have any soil cover. So um, the last one here I'm sowing is that basically um, this slide pretty much says it all. Uh, what comes up first will dominate that um, environment. So uh, this was some millet where, where I actually did um, knock down um, between um, harvesting lentils and sowing uh, the millet because there were some summer weeds. That's a flea bane that, um, you know, I didn't have a good enough brew and I left some flea banes behind. Even though that flea bane was sick, uh, its roots, so that's on 12 inch spacings and you can count the rows. It's, you know, five or six feet across that there is nothing growing in that space because that one plant survived. So I, th I think it's, um, you're asking for trouble sowing um, any new crop into established um, large plants or even weeds that have come up, you know, days or a week before uh, because whatever comes up first will rule the roost. So my strategy is generally to, um, if you've just harvested a crop and it's clean, 
put your put your um, seeds in there, have them in the soil dry, so that when it rains, they they are in pole position to come up first. And generally, um, they will. At wherever we did that last year, we hardly had any summer weeds come up. It was um, you know paddocks that were usually a blanket of um, uh, heliotrope or, um, you know, summer grass or melons um, or cowtrop. You know, with a strong stand of sunflowers and millet, we hardly had anything else in it. Um, even when we'd had, you know, 40 mil rain events, nothing came up because um, the real estate was already taken. So this is the sunflowers and millet coming coming um, coming up together. So um, this is that paddock from the cover uh, page. So the, the wheat crop was sprayed out um, mid uh, sort of late September. Um, this this was sown on the 7th of October after four millimetres of rain. Um, so on the 12th of October, we got seven millimetres of rain. But as you can see, so that's only two days before the photo, it had seven mil. So they actually came up on four mil of rain after they were sown dry. And then, yeah, so basically they were away and they didn't get any more rain. So they'd had no more rain to this point. So you know, now we're into November. You can see there how how much growth they've made, and there is just not another plant come up. There's just no other weeds have come up. That there hasn't been enough rain for other things to come up, and now these guys own the paddock. So um, a week before this photo, we did get 40 mil of rain, but you know th those little plants survived for about six weeks with on 10 mil of rain um, and then so this is a week after a big rain and the growth rates are incredible and once again I'm banging on about it but this uh, you know for me because it's not grazing and I need to um, get uh, you know I would have gone in here and um, been doing my first summer spray um, for for summer weed so um, you know the only things growing there are, are these is this summer cover crop so um yeah kicking on to january and um we really didn't get any more we got about 30 mil of rain early december um and that was it so considering the wheat was was a failure from lack of moisture it's incredible that these things um we decided um in december that we'd take this patch through to on the on the left there that was meant to be uh, safflower and millet on the right was sunflowers and millet so the safflower seed it must have been wrapped too high moisture um, no safflower came up uh, so that's another word of warning I'd say for people like when you do buy a seed make sure it's germination tested because you know you go to a lot of effort you've got that tiny window of opportunity and um, if your seed's no good well um, you don't have a chance. But it made a very good um, stand, so we wrapped the millet off it. So when we wrapped it, we win windrowed it at the end of February um, so that we um, uh, we didn't want to spray it with any chemicals and we wanted it to ripen off, which it, it wasn't going to ripen by itself, so um, didn't want to give up. So we, we windrowed it and then harvested it in March and just harvested it as a mixture and that was no hassle at all. Yeah, cleaned that seed a bit more but just still left it together and um, so that's what we're sowing um, you know this spring and summer is our own um, yeah our own seed so this is um, this is right now so this is a year later and uh, this was a canola crop that failed from lack of moisture this year yep, the sunflowers and millet they were sown in August it was a bit too cold um, it really uh, thinned the millet out uh, it what's what survived is going well now but um, yeah, it's had very little rain and, um, you know, it doesn't look like much, but it's better to have that kind of cover than no cover at all. So, um, so yeah, two pretty difficult years that we've um, we've tried it and it, it, it makes me really look forward to um, growing these plants um, when we've had a wet winter and we can maybe, you know, store some winter moisture and um, have that to use in spring because we're really sowing uh, on an empty, empty tank. Uh, so far and 
these these guys are still you know making a pretty good effort so yes i'm pretty excited we work we will get some decent rain soon um one year soon i hope and um i'm pretty excited about what they can do and if i was still a sheep farmer um yes there's just so many options uh, to get a, a amazing you know value for grazing over those summer months and into autumn so the other thing for me that's given me value out of the summer forages is that they've um, they've really held my farm together this year we've had a horrible year we grew a lot of lentils last year and you can see from this photo that's just where the seed was turned off for a sec um, uh, you know once those lentils have rep, are repped this is only a couple of months later there's only a bit of old wheat straw from the year before there's not much holding the land together so just that little bit of millet um, it doesn't look like much but it was the difference between holding that paddock together this year while the crop established and not and and the um, the crops they really uh, I don't think that I've lost anything in yield potential this year even though it's one of our driest years on record. Yeah, there's something really important happening with the biology um, supporting those winter crops afterwards that's um, made up for the moisture that they took. So this is that same paddock uh, on my cover slide again. This is only a month ago or might've been two months ago. But um, so that's the wind road um, stubble from the sunflowers and millet and that ended up being completely buried. So we built a fair bit of soil from that re residue. I think there's probably about six inches more soil across that paddock at the expense of my good neighbours. Um, but if I, you, you saw how a failed wheat crop from last year and, and it, it would have failed again this year if it, if, if it hadn't had any cover on it. So yeah, once again, it's, it stopped that. And this is banging on again, again about cover. I did have no covers last year and it was a canola paddock and um, this year the wind uh, has been uh, drifting it and I haven't been able to establish any crop on it until a couple of weeks ago I, I got some warm season covers sunnies and millet and corn in on there um, you can see the odd little plant but then we got our biggest rain for the year last week and um, had about 20 mils of rain in, in about five minutes and without any cover to protect it we've gone from wind rain erosion to water erosion, even the dog's upset. I just included this one at the end because um, it's not a summer one, but it is an all year rounder and it's that tillage radish. And um, I just undersowed or just threw some um, tillage radish in with um, wheat when we were sowing it in um, April. And so, um, uh, yeah, it just grew with, with the wheat. And when I, when I uh, sprayed out the broadleafs, um, I sprayed it out. But even at that stage, it had quite a, a nice fat little tap root going down. So, um, you, you know, for the cost of the seed, uh, it, it, um, it did some tillage for me and, um, you know, would have left behind some um, goodies. Uh, Grant Sims from um, Echuca in Victoria reckons that these uh, tillage radish tubers are like Red Bull for worms and um, these... Um, these tubers end up being like the big avatar tree that all the biology um, comes to. I left this one, um, like I left a little area, I didn't spray the broadleafs out and at the end of the day, I, I think I would have made more money out of growing the tillage radishes and letting them set seed than growing the wheat. But um, yeah, fantastic little plant and uh, would be good in a lot of mixes, I think in the Mallee environment and um, yeah, leave behind a lot of good stuff. So. That's, um, that's me pretty much. But the only other thing I mentioned was just to be really aware of, um, of uh, chemical residues. So aware of what, what your chemical residues are in your paddock um, so that any effects that might have on your summer stuff. Excellent. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Bruce Morgan, and we'll have some questions at the end for our producers and for Craig as well. So, yep. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Bruce Morgan from Wongari, to share his experiences with um, summer forage crops. Thanks, Bruce. Well, thanks, Jody. Um, yes, uh, my name's Bruce Morgan, and um, I'm lucky enough to farm on Lower Eyre Peninsula this year, and we farm in the Coulter and Wongari districts of Lower Eyre Peninsula. And that's a photo taken off the top of Mount Dutton, looking over our farmyard and our canola crop. So um, we'll um, 
I work, work with my two brothers and our wives in a mixed farming enterprise and we've been trialling cover crops and a, a single disc seeding with the aim of reducing reliance on synthetic inputs to improve soil health and profitability. Um, so that's a quick brief of where we are and what we've been up to. I'm currently the lead, uh, chair of the leader, Lowry Agricultural Development Association on the Lower Rear Peninsula and I've also spent some time on the Sample Board. Um, we farm original farmers, Mount Dutton, uh, settled in 1886. Um, we own about 2,800 hectares of our own in a 450 to 525 mil rainfall zone. Um, yeah, 21, 21, 2,100 hectares arable and balances grazing, swampland, native veg. We also lease a bit more land in our district locally. And we sort of crop between 2,000 and 2,400 hectares annually of wheat, canola, barley, lupins, and more recently cover crops. We also run a um, shelf replacing flock of 1,800 Dooney Merino ewes and a plug for um, O'Brien's uh, O'Brien blood. What got me thinking about having to change, and, and I'm probably coming at some cover crops on a slightly different angle to, or well, I've arrived at cover cropping and summer cropping from a slightly different angle. Um, this was the 13th uh, of June, I think it was in 2014. These paddocks had been sown and then we had an extreme rain event. And uh, I guess you look at that and the amount of damage it's done, I, I just thought, well, there has to be a better way to what we're currently farming. And we've got no control over the weather events and we need to, have to, need to do something to minimise their impacts. So continuous cropping, we've been doing that for quite some time. Full stubble retention, we've been doing that. And um, high inputs, and they're still not enough to stop this from happening. And we have stock in our system as well. So input costs, soil, water holding capacity, ground cover, soil biology, and the mining of our organic carbon were all things that we needed to address to stay profitable. Um, and we'd been researching single disc seeding systems and cover crops to see how they'd fit into our farming system. So when I was on the board at Santa, we applied for some funding through GRDC to subsidise a trip to America. And as a group of us went over there to attend uh, in January, February in 2015, so attend a couple of the um, no-till farming conferences, uh, no-till on the plains at Salina and Canvas, Kansas, and also the... Uh, High Plains No Till at Billington in Colorado. And while we were there, we had the opportunity to also visit the Veris factory in Salina that's uh, responsible for the um, on the go pH mapping that you see kicking around the country inside nowadays. So we had a look at their factory and their designing. Um, we also got the opportunity to visit five um, farms in three different states where people were using cover crops successfully. Um, yeah, that's one of the various machines. They had a test paddock out the back of their factory, so we looked at that. Um, this was a pretty busy and educational 11 days. Also had the chance to travel with Rick Bieber, who some of you would know, and um, for all the farm visits and his willingness to share his knowledge and encouragement was a valuable learning experience. His advice was to buy a small single dis zero disturbance drill and start experimenting with a few different mixtures to see what would work in our environment. Um, on the right hand side, that's standing in a cover crop. Uh, that's in Colorado. Uh, so obviously that's winter time over there. Or So in that cover crop, there was actually, um, not that you can see with those photos, but there was very small sierra rye coming up in that, but it was about to get covered with snow. And uh, this is covered in snow. The top left photo is standing in another cover crop. The field behind that was just a bare um, paddock that had been farmed normally. So this guy here was capturing all the snow that was blowing off his paddock uh, in his cover and uh, getting a fair bit more extra moisture. Um, yeah, driving on the roads, that was uh, heading to Nebraska one day, meeting those trucks at those speeds and wasn't a whole lot of fun, but yeah, there was quite a bit of snow there while we were there. Um, another one there on the left-hand side at the bottom there was just looking at um, the soil benefits and what was going on under the ground. And another photo on the bottom right there is also, I don't know whether you can see it, but there, there's little rows of cereal rye coming up in that too. That's in corn stalks, into roads, into sowing into corn. 
residue. So after our visit over there, when I returned home, we discussed how we could start our journey of a different way of thinking. It was decided we'd plant a um, mixed species winter cover crop. And then we also started the search for a small disc seeder. So that uh, is our first little paddock that we sowed. So that was um, a small 22 hectare paddock that we'd, I'll just go back a step. We, we thought it was probably easier to establish a mixed winter crop because we knew what we were doing with winter crops. And our goal for this was to plant a mixed species winter crop for grazing opportunities. And then we would um, spray it out and then plant our summer mix into it uh, at, a, at a time of the year when we thought we had moisture there to, to still establish it because our summer rainfall was um, quite often not that much and um, trying to sow something in November, December was fairly hit and miss. So we thought we'd have a crack at establishing something into some cover while there's moisture still there. So we decided to go with our winter mix to start with, to set our paddock up, to have a go at it. Um, so it's established quite well. It's just a mix of whatever we had, pretty much barley, oats, lupins, peas. Um, um, no, there's no tillage radish went in there. Oh, vetch. And it was a 22 hectare paddock and obviously it was going to run a fair few stock on it. So we sprayed a line through the middle of the fence, did a half with electric wire. And then we ran sheep in that. So um, I haven't got numbers on the stocking, but we had about, I think it was a mob of 400 years with just over 100% lambs. And they rotated through both sides of that twice over a period of probably eight to 10 weeks. Um, so this is uh, when you talk about a sowing opportunity, we'd in from that point through to the, um, November we'd sourced our little disc seeder and then uh, obviously when you're harvesting you don't really feel like going seeding but we thought if we wanted to make this work we had to do it. So there's a big uh, rain event forecasting coming through and we were flat out trying to sow it in front of it and we got two thirds of the paddock sown uh, in front of that. And the right hand side photo is a picture of the mixture which was um, I th it was a uh, millet, sorghum, Cow peas, we chucked a lot of things in here. We had cow peas, lab lab, sunflowers, uh, maize, and tillage radish. So that was the mixture. Um, so we planted that. I might just come back to this slide if I can after this. And as you can see, even though we, um, we thought we'd done it right and we had 25 mil of rain, um, we had two great big sunflowers and nothing much else. And wildwood was still king. But we did have some more rain a bit later on and eventually there was a, a lot more came out and um, it did sort of encourage us to perhaps have another go at this. And I think we learnt that possibly we'd sown, and as the previous two speakers pointed out, we actually sowed it too shallow. And I think when it come in dry, it dried out and left it stranded. So we've sort of learnt from that. So I'll just go back. So in that particular paddock, is we picked that one because it had been underperforming, but it's had... Um, two winter crops and a summer crop in that. And then last year it was sown with, uh, not last year, 2016 was sown with diamond canola, which yielded just over three tonne. Last year it was sown with set to wheat, that went just over four tonnes. So it certainly performed all right uh, the last two years. And um, I guess we're not sure whether that's the, because of the cover crop or the single disc seeding or whether it is a combination of both and there is something changing I think it's probably a combination of all of it. Um, so that, that got us thinking when we'd try this on a little bit larger scale. So in April 2016, we sowed a 32 hectare mixed species winter cover with a disc seeder. And this did have tillage radish in it in winter time this time. So we had um, the usual, um, I think that was maybe barley we had in there and uh, tillage radish, um, lupins, vetch, and some peas. And so we had planted all those in there. And um, so with the aim of um, um, grazing it with stock, but uh, 
uh, people might remember that uh, 2016 was a reasonably wet spring and shearing got held up so the sheep didn't get into the paddock quite as soon as we wanted them there. So the tillage radish all came up and sort of got to a pretty large stage. Um, so we were a bit concerned about them out there flowering, so we decided to get a rubber tied roller and we rolled the whole paddock flat, which um, broke off all the tubers. It's, they stick up sort of two or three inches, maybe more than that out of the ground at times. So we, um, in the bottom left hand side, you can see the white radish tubers laying in amongst the oats here that they'd just broke them off, so that stopped that from going to seed. And then we got our sheep in there and grazed it after that. And they, um, I think we had 700 ewe hoggets went into there and they stayed there for quite some time. We didn't fence it in half because we had a big mob of sheep, so we left them in there. That That's that um, a mixed species that was that was um, raised down and then we sowed a summer mix into that one. So uh, that's that's um, a John Deere little disc seeder sowing into that. So very, very minimum disturbance and... Uh, I'll skip through this and that's the result of that crop. So um, we had some rain in December uh, that just got that germinated and came up reasonably well. And as Ben said, once it rains on it, it does tend to grow reasonably quickly. So you can see those four photos there. Uh, um, what are we talking about? A fortnight apart. And uh, there's a fair change from over a fortnight period of what it looks like. And yeah, there's the amount of, amount of beneficial things that come with it is um, pretty good. Um, so as was pointed out, 2017 was a pretty dry, horrible start, even on the lower peninsula, we had um, a lack of rain. And uh, so this is what it looked like. And we, we decided that we'd have to graze that because we didn't have any a lot of stock and we were buying hay in, which is unusual for us. So these paddocks got grazed down and uh, so we grazed them all down and then we decided that they'd been grazed a bit too heavily so we had to sow them back into um, uh, some of the, the following year. Um, so this is in uh, this time last year. Uh, we, we sowed these um, into, um, into the winter mixes that were there um, that had been grazed down and then uh, when we had rain, there was Italian ryegrass in that mix. I forgot to mention that. And I think what happened is, uh, as Ben pointed out, if there's something that's there, it takes some moisture first. And we had a lot of lot of rain that should have actually got that all established a lot better than it did. And I think it was because the Italian ryegrass actually sourced the moisture and used it up before the uh, summer fodder crops could get going. But they still grew and they... Um, turned into something useful as feed later on down the track. And once again, this 2018 was a very dry, slow start as well. So we we had the benefit of some uh, green feed to run some ewes in. And that's, uh, I guess, we, we grazed them right down and then finished up planting a canola crop in there um, this year, about a month later than we intended to because it was still being grazed. So I guess what we've learnt from... Uh, um, cover crops and summer crops is uh, planting a winter mix of your own seeds is a good starting point if you want to try and set a paddock up to do something um, and to help this make make it work on your own environment. Livestock helps with the cost recovery and, and I guess because this is a sheep connect it's, it's a pretty beneficial thing for livestock. You've got a um, different food source here over a different time of year. I think this is probably something that's been taught out, taught out from the conversations earlier too. Sunflower, sorghum, millet, tillage radish and forage rape are all pretty good survivors. We've had very good success with them so far. Some are legumes that haven't been so successful in both their survival and their nodulation. So we may be better off using lupin, vetch and peas. That's our experience. So that photo on the right hand side actually up the top is one I've stolen from Ted Langley down at Bordertown. And you can see if the soil's not disturbed, that's an old root that a new root's gone down through it so it's opened up a channel and allowed the root go down through the soil moisture so um i guess on our side of things if we continue to do more of the same don't expect a different or better outcome uh, we can't continue to rely on synthetic fertilizers fungicides herbicides insecticides it's not sustainable and we think it's time to start weaning ourselves off 
Uh, there's more life under the soil surface and above it, and if we feed it properly and provide living roots and shelter for our harsh, from our harsh summers instead of killing it, we will be re rewarded over time. And uh, once established, summer covers will survive, and this is a field day we did around Epinix looking at various crops, and um, obviously, yeah, they haven't been grazed, but they can grow rather large. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive seed, um, although we have used, a plug for AGF, we've used AGF um, tillage, summer tillage max, I think it's called, and we've added a few things to it a couple of times. Um, low disturbance disc seeders is more suited to sow into heavy residues, and, um, and we're using them as a break crop as well in running stock on it to recover costs. And we've been able to keep something alive in that one paddock we were talking about there a while ago that's had something green in it for two years. So it's, it's had a green plant in it for over two, or it's actually, it's two and a half years now. So it's had something growing in it for a fair while. Um, just a few things, start with small changes, build your knowledge and confidence, um, make your own recipe that suits your needs and environments, learn to work with mother nature, there's no point arguing with her. And in my 40 years of farming, it's always been too early, too late, too wet, too dry, too hot, too cold, too windy. Don't waste your time and energy worrying about things you can't control. Concentrate on the things you can control and improve our farming system and profit. Have some seed ready to sow if an opportunity presents. It may be too late if you have to order it in at short notice. And, and yeah, seeds don't grow in a bag, even though that might have been um, maybe contradicted earlier. And I think it's time to change. So. Um, and in 2018, all of our cropping program was sown with a 1890 John Deere disc seeder. And in the future, we're hoping to do our harvesting with a stripper front to keep higher straw loads here. And I guess this was a photo I looked at one of the, at the Burlington conference we're at on the left hand side at the top there. There's two little John Deere disc seeders, and there's a write up on there. They were 1911, they were um, designed to sow. And crop back into the corn rows as a protection. So all of a sudden we're back where we started. So I guess have we learned anything or we're just going back to the future? Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I've got a couple of questions and I might put this one to um, Craig first and then um, ask Ben for his comment. The question is, what sort of seeder would you recommend? So Bruce has obviously used disc or a tine seeder. And if you go tines, what sort of tines? Knife points, others. Craig, I'll start with you. Thanks, Jody. Um, yeah, nice to get the easy questions. Um, <laughs> I try my best. I don't, I, don't reckon, I don't reckon that there is one seeder to do everything. So depending on uh, soil type, and uh, time of year and uh, trash load, etc. I think in an ideal world, uh, you know, that, that minimal disturbance um, is what we're aiming for and discs deliver that, but they have downfalls with, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I think like I said earlier, there's the, the main principle is, um, sowing depth and seed soil contact and how you go about achieving that um, yeah, is going to be you know, one what you've already got on farm but two uh, what you find works in your own situations um, yeah I, I don't I don't think I've dodged the question in that no, but, uh, no. thank yeah. you Ben would you like to add anything to that uh, yeah I, I think I think for uh, Light soil types in our lower rainfall, the the this seed is a no-brainer um, because just don't lose moisture when you sow, um, and it's actually easier to seed placement. You can just cut that little slot and put the seeds at the bottom of it, and close it up like you were never there, and you just leave all the mulch and standing stubble um, where it is around it. I just feel like at this time of the year, as soon as you go through with a with a time and a point, you just lose so much moisture. Um, and um, you know, better to I mean, it's better to have a go with what you've got 
but I think it improves your odds by a long way if uh, using a disc well set up. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one last question I'll finish on just because I'm conscious of time and then we might start with you, Craig. Questions come in about what sort of grazing regimes would be best for your summer forage crops. Yep. So do we Radio. advocate... Yep. The absolute, uh, I suppose, best practice would be to have them moving through the crop with a back fence hot wire um, you know, so that you're allowing regrowth as they move through. And I think there's figures of something like you know, a, a normal utilisation for a summer crop would be uh, 40 or 50% uh, versus uh, some grazing systems would be achieving 70% utilisation um, with electric fences. So uh, I think there's uh, a couple of things there and that is the regrowth that you achieve. So rather than the stock picking an area and just letting everything else go rank and, and sitting there in one spot and overgrazing another, that you get better regrowth out of the whole area uh, and to the maintaining the quality of the feed. Um, so easier said than done in some areas, but just uh, electric fencing is getting, yeah, uh, it, it does make it easier. So. Yeah, certainly has in, um, in my experience on our property anyway. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to thank our three speakers this evening, Craig, Ben and Bruce. Would like to acknowledge um, our funding bodies, um, AWR, Primary Industries and Region South Australia, and the Sheep Industry Fund. We thank you for your time tonight and we'll catch you next time we have a webinar. Thanks so much. <laughs>